Welcome to Sweet Home Katusa, everybody, and I'm proud today to McCracken Posted Jr. on to talk about this excellent book that happened inside our community in Katusa County, Zenith Man. Listen, thanks for coming on. I mean, this is, um, my wife just poured through this, and actually she poured through it, and then I read it, and then she actually got the audio version and listened to the audio well, version, so. Well, I'm flattered, and, and thank you. Um, it was a... Uh, it was something that I wanted to write every day since January 15, 1999, but I couldn't quite put it together in my head. And as many people know, I gave the story away to anybody that came along that wanted to hear it. Uh, Forensic Files, American Justice, People Magazine, the Washington Post, uh, NPR snap judgment. Yet it was not satisfying even the tellings of those stories. They were they were limited in time, of course. Sure. Um, you know, there, there would be uh, the NPR snap judgment. Uh, raw material was probably around five hours. And they put it down to 25 minutes. Sure, yeah, lost, so, lost so, that translation. So a lot of is lost there. And in the same sense, uh, what finally changed was a juror in the case was doing another podcast, uh, one that never came out yet, but it was uh, through uh, UTC in Chattanooga. And um, this uh, podcaster and his class, they were doing a very thorough job interviewing people. And they interviewed Kimberly Clark Barnes, one of our jurors, who had since become a nurse in Alaska. Oh, wow. And so he's talking to her, and um, she said, I want you to tell Mr. Poston something. And I, she said, I think Alvin Ridley may have autism. And I mean, just the minute it was told, and you have to understand where we are in history, nobody was talking about autism in adults in 1999. No, absolutely uh, not. The, the spectrum uh, had just been kind of uh, introduced as a concept, which of course, it's real. So uh, it's been with us since time began, but but the spectrum as a, a, a way to diagnose was relatively new. And they were only talking about children at that time. And half of the community was angrily looking for what causes this. Sure, oh yes. Well, we've had autism, I think, as long as we've had man. And um, so, it just made sense to me, but nevertheless, I took Alvin, my former client, who I still had a, a, a weekly contact with, uh, with his permission, took him to Atlanta. With his permission, he allowed me to tell the diagnosis of him being on the, the spectrum. It explained everything, because one of the, the more interesting things about this story is the conflict. Now. I'm a kind of a micromanaging sure. <laughs> neurotic person. <laughs> and that is the absolute worst thing to pair with uh, uh, someone who is neurodivergent. Because I was insisting that he be a certain way and act a certain way and present a certain way. And he would have nothing of it. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and I think now, you know, because we see you guys out in the community, we just ran into you guys yesterday, as a matter of fact, out and had a lunch. And, and I think a lot of people that had run into them for years, they just didn't understand, you know, and that's where you talk about it in the book, how people label you or people, you know, say, oh, that person's this or that. And it, it's it's not their fault. That's just kind of something they're born with, right? And, you know, oh, absolutely. And we're all functioning. My wife says I function with ADHD every day, right? But we all function with things and deal with them and... But the perception, a lot of times, just gets tagged onto somebody, and that's where it just really goes downhill in a hurry. You're right. And, you know, in a small town, especially in the South, we, we've always kind of, at least in literary representations, there's always been kind of uh, 
this small town eccentric. Right. And there are several in this book. Now, many of them probably would have similar diagnoses if, if they had been lived at a time that they could have been diagnosed. And so hopefully, you know, for example, uh, the Renzo and John Wiggins' mother, uh, John Roberts' grandmother, uh, Judy Wiggins, uh, she, I had worked with that law firm very early, right out of law school. So I knew uh, Judy Wiggins. I'm from Graysville. I grew up literally, I, I used to bike over here. I li lived that close uh, to the Swanson family who, who owned this land then. And um, I didn't know all the people of Ringo when I went there for school. So uh, my local friends would kind of point out well, there's that person. They, they, everybody's kind of scared of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, at the time, Alvin, I didn't have a bad perception of Alvin. He was our TV guy. My dad really liked Alvin, and they had this bartering relationship where my dad had a grinder, and he would sharpen people's lawnmower blades. So you know, I would meet people. They would come up to the garage to you know um, get their lawnmower blades ground or they would leave them there and then you know they'd come back and get them and I was to you know there was never never any money that changed hands it was just like he'll do something for you they'll do something for you later and and I did not remember this until Alvin brought up a story during the representation of how he met Andre the Giant <laughs> and that Andre the Giant eats two dozen eggs every morning and or a dozen, I can't remember, but it was an outrageous amount of eggs, and a loaf of bread, and uh, that made me remember that I had heard that story before. And so it made me remember that Alvin had been to my house when I was about 13. That's crazy, it's a small he, world. He came in is. with a new TV knob. My mother had just waved him in from the outside so I turn around and there's a strange man in the living room watching <laughs> wrestling over my over my shoulder. And uh, that's when he first told me that he met Andre the Giant. Well, I went and told everybody at school that I know somebody who knows Andre the Giant. I sure. was excited about yeah. it. And when he told me again, I thought, you're that guy. <laughs> you know, I'd not put it together. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I, my sister went to school with Alvin. But uh, Judy Wiggins, who was Renzo and John's mother, she was his fourth grade teacher. And during the representation, she told me, she said, uh, Alvin cried every day of fourth grade. Wow. And this was, uh, you know, I remember that when he got his diagnosis. Now, wonderfully, we have services for sure. kids. And, and you know, when it's caught, uh, there are services and there is education that we can all get. Uh, the, those of us who may plot out more neurotypically, uh, we can all kind of understand how to, uh, how to best interact. Um, but I'll tell you, when, since the diagnosis, Alvin has been so much easier going. He, a lot of his paranoia has subsided. Um, he uh, he fancies himself quite the ladies' man. He'll tell me he has a new girlfriend, and I'll say, "Well, what's her name?" He'll say, "Well, I'll, I'll I don't know yet. I'll get back to you later." But it was somebody who was kind to him. Usually, a, a server in a restaurant who was kind to him. Sure, and and, and that's uh, so it had to be a relief for him all of a sudden to be like there is something in the background that was causing all this. So it had to be a, like a weight off of his shoulders all of a sudden to feel like, hey, you know, it, it, it's there's something there that I couldn't necessarily control as the reason I struggled so much in different aspects of my life. So I'm Maybe sure so. I've, I've mentioned before we started that I've been on a podcast of a, a guy who's uh, uh, autistic on the Asperger's end of the spectrum. And it was fascinating hearing uh, what's been very moving to me is I put this book out there 
not knowing how the autistic community was going to react to it. Uh, because it's describing my struggle for 15 months of trying to understand why I want this guy help me, help right. him. And, and so it was, uh, I've been very moved by the reactions of the families of children and adults with, uh, who are on the spectrum because they recognize it from page one. Right, and I, you know, I'm writing about a time that I didn't know it, and I really, I kind of strung uh, uh, anecdotes together in, I guess I'd call them chapters, but over the years I would say, well, I'm going to write about the cats, so I don't forget it, and so I would write the cat story, and then I would say, okay, I got to write about him giving the bums rush to the federal marshals in Rome. <laughs> and I'm, so I would write that story. So when I got the book contract, it was fairly easy to put it all together because I'd already written it. How many years did you say that you were doing that? I mean, how? 22 years. 22 years. And I would write it to remember it. And I would write it to, I, I took several stabs at writing this with others. Um, I, I just didn't have the confidence and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And I mean, you know what? And I, and, I, and I hope if the book does nothing else, there'll be some Catoosa County people that say, well, well if he can write, yeah, I, know. I can write. I mean, cause that's it. I mean, it, you know, like for me, it'd be like, I'm going to write a book. I mean, how do you even put that together and all that? But you did it over such a long period of time. It just all kind of naturally came together. And then like you said, all of a sudden when that interview happened and you saw, so yeah, it wasn't something where you just sat down over a weekend and wrote a book. That's when though it, it started moving fast because when Alvin's autism diagnosis came through, the book formed in my head. I had a, you know, it was almost a, it would have been insulting to just dismiss Alvin as an odd guy or an eccentric as we often sure. characterize people. Um, and so it, it but it, it really made sense on how literal he needs to be spoken to uh, in literal terms. And I would forget and I would get ahead of myself. Uh, like at trial when uh, after Jesus told him to testify <laughs> against my against my advice but 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 I was thinking too much like a lawyer. I was thinking if I put him on the stand and he starts telling the jury about that van that the county seized in 1984, <laughs> they're going to think this guy's the coldest coldest hearted person in the world. But that's where he thought the injustice really was. Sure. And I would argue with him about just helping me help him and he just didn't think we needed to talk much about Virginia because he didn't kill her but they did take my van he would say yeah so, yeah. Then, so let's talk about that so I had to indulge him and I just dove into the clerk's office and I learned a lot from this ancient litigation several lawsuits one an eviction case against he and Virginia an eviction case where the uh, Ringgold Housing Authority were evicting them from the first public housing that Ringgold built back in the, uh, the early 60s. And the housing is still there. I'm assuming the authority is still, is still active. But, um, but it was a nice program, a, you know, federal housing program that Ringgold took advantage of and got some housing. and. Alvin of Virginia qualified for a two-bedroom apartment and um, you know it this takes people back in time because you remember or you may not have been here yet but Catoosa County used to be a dry county. Now I do remember yeah. you talking about yes. <laughs> now we had the cheat of the state line <laughs> that everybody yeah, yeah. slipped across and I go into to my family history with alcohol quite deeply in this book. It kind of surprised myself how much I poured into that, uh, you know, family secrets. 
but I was following the lead of my example and I was underage drinking and being irresponsible with alcohol and but but we it, it, it always interested me that we and the politicians prided that we were a dry county or more recently when Fort Oglethorpe was so proud that it was a dry city right but there was an unincorporated island in the city yeah. right on 27 and I think Nick's package store was sitting right in the middle of it and had a monopoly for Fort Oglethorpe and the city was not getting any of the revenue really and so uh, it, while I was in the legislature uh, we did away with unincorporated islands now the effect of that was they could not take away something from Nick's package store that they already had. So they were forced to come up with rules and regulations and licensure for everybody else in the city. So in a way, you know, it, it, it allowed the city to get a lot of revenue. And, sure. it, and, and we could just quit acting like we were better than everybody when everybody was just, just going, going, right over going to the unincorporated forever. island yeah. or just across sure the, you know across from Graysville it was always Dodge City that's right that was and my that, there, that right? was my nemesis and and, <laughs> and you know I would have as a teenager I would have big arguments with my dad because I uh, you know we would hide the car keys or we would pour out this stuff which was kind of counterproductive because we're pouring out he's gonna want it you know yeah. so uh you know coming up with excuses why I couldn't take him to dodge city and and it was just it was it, it affects you as a kid yeah and that's what's so great about the book i mean it's it's there's just so many different things going on in there that people don't know about our area or but more importantly you know, some peek into your your life as well. Well, well and I, I can't say enough though what a wonderful person my father was. And that's what uh, we get so wrong with shortcuts in the way things are presented and the way things are written. There's this stereotypical southern alcoholic man sure. wearing the wife beater t-shirt, <laughs> you know. And, yeah. and, and my dad was not that. My dad was a very highly productive uh, uh, in management at Wheeland Foundry for 40 years and and a wonderful father never never saw him be abusive to anybody or our mother but there was just a sadness about him and the alcoholic switch was flipped to where he absolutely needed to drink and um, and you know until he fell asleep and and there was just a sadness and an absence that I felt as a kid sure but but as a kid you interpret it as what am I doing that makes him drink that's that's the way you always interpret it kids always internalize right there's yeah. something bad's going on what what did I do to cause that was most of the time they didn't do anything and I was well I was well into adulthood before I, I just took the position you know I don't have to follow that path but as a kid you'd follow that path and I think back and I'm not going to name any names but my buddies that I ran around with that we were doing these really irresponsible things uh, we all kind of were children of dads that were in that World War II generation that had, um, you know, some some issues with alcohol, and we were just following suit, right? Um, you know, it's just the way it was. But back to this, um, Alvin. You know, I, I had the vague knowledge of him, uh, and even in high school I went by to try to sell a yearbook ad to him once <laughs> this didn't this this got edited out but I went into Ridley's uh, Zenith TV shop to sell a yearbook ad for the RHS shadow yearbook which I was the photographer but they pushed me to sell ads as well well blank stare that's all I got from him you know I'm sure and a, and a decline 
And so uh, I just thought, well, that's a strange, strange man. Um, the place did not look like your average TV shop. It was very, uh, uh, you know, you had some uh, decor that the corporation, Zenith Corporation, would provide a big cardboard cutout. Right. But then the place is looking a little shabby, you know, in terms of its general upkeep. Well, flash forward to the 80s, the place just got shuttered and padlocked. And inside the glass, because it had a lot of frontage on Nashville Street, began to appear these missives that were typed out, you could tell, on the same typewriter. And they were damning everybody in town, all the public officials, uh, for going against him, ruining his business, taking his van. Yeah. And, you know, this continued for years. And I used to go read them to see if I'd made them yet, you know, because I was getting into politics. But one of the more fun things that I remember, because it was 1984, and uh, oh, my buddies, Greg Bentley, who you know, and uh, Jeff Carver, who's from right, uh, right across the line uh, in East Brainerd. We all went to church together at Graysville United Methodist. And we decided we were, I was in law school and they were in school and we decided we were gonna take a cross country trip. So we, Greg finds a van that we rented and we were about to go and I said, I wanna, I wanna go to this all candidate rally because I was really working on campaigns already, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the interaction that politics gave you. But um, Alvin Ridley was running for sheriff. Isn't that ironic, right? Yeah, yeah. And Alvin Ridley was running for sheriff out of a rage, a really misplaced rage, against J.D. Stewart, who... Uh, also had opposition from Roger Blackwell in the Democratic primary, and then Charles Correll in the in the general election. Charles Correll, who was a dear dear man, um, I grew up with his daughters, and and he was a court services officer until uh, close to his uh, passing. Uh, and then you have Alvin enter the race with all those. Al Alvin enters the race with a grudge. Sure. And what was fascinating about Alvin entering the race was, do you remember, you've probably seen this, uh, the sheriffs used to give out these honorary deputy cards. Yes. And Alvin still got his. And it's signed by J.D. <laughs> Stewart. And, you know, Alvin took it seriously. So when he, uh, J.D. gave Alvin... Um, that card in 1976. Well, that was J.D. Stewart's comeback, I believe. I'm trying to remember when I was a kid. J.D. Stewart was sheriff when I was a small child. And then I think in 68, Leroy Brown upset him. Uh, and Leroy Brown held on to the office for two terms. So this would have been 1976 that J.D. won it back and immediately rewarded his friends and supporters with the, making them honorary <laughs> deputies. Well, really, all this was for is if you got caught speeding in another place, you flash that. It's kind of like these sheriffs uh the stickers on the, the back stickers. The black and, and, yeah. and blue stickers yeah the stickers it's kind of yeah. a wink <laughs> it's kind of a wink of i'm one of you and uh but he gave alvin one another way to get to alvin's close to alvin's heart and sam dills was smart about this and leroy brown was smart about this and ultimately jd stewart was smart about this buying a tv set from alvin that, that locked you in forever, <laughs> yeah, that's it. and that made my dad uh, 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 one, of his, one of his special people. So, uh, in any event, Alvin has this card that he hangs on to, to this day, from 1976. But when he gets mad about the taking of his van in 1984, and by the way, the only thing that J.D. Stewart 
uh, probably didn't even know about the 5A on the ban. Alvin had filed so much litigation just against everybody. He included Chief Land from Ringgold, who did nothing wrong. And Chief Land, or someone counterclaims, and they seize Alvin's van as part of that counterclaim to pay a judgment for obviously frivolous litigation. Right. Well, Alvin fights it and turns it around and gets the van back. But it was sadly Elsie Cripps who just picked up the thing to go execute. So he gets a wrecker and goes and executes the uh, warrant. There was a, a little uh, in the legal section of the county paper notice of sale of the van. But Alvin turns it around, gets it back, but he refuses to accept it. In Alvin's world, it will start a new statute of limitations, and Alvin wants to keep the statute open for now. So it's still sitting in the... 40 years, and now it's got trees growing up around it. So Alvin, uh, that, that was the way Alvin thought. But at the same time, I was realizing the guy won a case in the Court of Appeals representing himself. At that time, I hadn't done that. <laughs> and so I, I had to, you know, give credit where credit was due. But Alvin runs against J.D. Stewart in 1984, citing his eight years of law enforcement experience. Because <laughs> he's got the car. <laughs> because he got the car. <laughs> and... Uh, and at the rally on the courthouse steps, um, I just thought, I got to see this. You know, this is going to be a, a, a circus. Alvin rises up, goes to the microphone, and he pulls out a big cassette recorder and he pushes play. And all of his detractors and hecklers had to stop and stand up for the national anthem. Alvin had taped the national anthem from the WDEF sign-off where Luther, everybody remembers Luther Massengill's voice, sure. usually on radio. Occasionally you heard it on Channel 12 TV because it was the same station. And he was saying, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, WDEF is signing off for the night and, and here's our national anthem. Well, Alvin played that and all of his naysayers had to stand up and remove their hats. And it just reset the whole crowd. And I Brilliant, thought, right? this guy's this guy's pretty smart. I thought, what a you know, if you get if everybody's he he defied expectations because everybody just thought he was gonna get up and start rambling about his van. Well, that followed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still made for a good uh, yeah. good interview up there. <laughs> yes, but uh, but I just it, it stuck with me because I thought, you know, this guy he knew how to at least tame that crowd for a minute before, you know, he, he you know, the, the snickers started happening again. Yeah, so, you know, and I, he goes into the book, but obviously kind of set the backdrop here of what happens, how you get involved, and just, we don't want to give away too much because folks really, you, read, you need to read the book. It's amazing. Well, I appreciate that because, uh, and, and thank you. Um, Alvin sought me out, but he didn't know how to approach me. And my office at the time was behind the post office. Uh, Kevin Sylvie and I had bought Ed Bomar's old house, and it was a ranch house. It's now a parking lot. But um, we, um, we, we set up our private solo practices. Uh, we've never been associated as partners or anything, but... Uh, Mike Giglio had then joined us when he got out of law school. And, you know, it's just easier to share rent, share sure. resources. At that time, we shared a single secretary. It's showing, you, showing you how much our practices have grown since then. Wow. We, we shared a single secretary in uh, Tammy Harden. When I got appointed to be part-time juvenile court judge, I knew that Tammy Harden had talents beyond that law office. And so I appointed her as uh, administrator, and she's done an incredible job now as court, juvenile court administrator. And um, 
never been reversed. So, well, uh, and, and, and real quick on that, my wife just talks about the amazing job you do in the juvenile court system with these kids that get lost and need help and just it, it, thank you for that. By well, way. well, and now you know my background, I kind of get where the some of them are coming from. Sure. Um, but in any event, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm in the state legislature for four terms and a bit of transformation happened during that period of time because I, for one, in my third year there, I developed type one insulin dependent diabetes. My sister Nancy had developed it about 10 years before. And just out of the blue, we had, we had nobody else in the family that had type 1. Wow. They quit calling it juvenile onset because of people like us. They were getting it as adults. So they just called it type 1. That's a transformation. That is a life transformation. But it's also a wonderful reminder that we're not here forever. Sure. And that's a gift. Absolutely. Yeah, that changed everything about my time in the legislature. I became immediately more mature. I started thinking of the big picture on things. Um, I'm sure that didn't make you popular. In no, no, absolutely not. The to... Under the gold dome, I was extremely unpopular because uh, Ken Abney in, in Ringgold, he, uh, he pulled me off the side one day well, the way I like to tell it is when I got elected, I had, and, and it's pretty heady, when I was 28 years old, and here's all these established corporations and businesses that line up to, you know, kiss your ass. Lobbyists, as we yeah. all call them today, but yeah. yes, that's exactly what it is. And it's a, it's a bit heady. Yeah, for 28. My, my, my first invitation to anything about the legislature was come meet your legislative class, Republicans and Democrats, the class that was elected in 1988. Our first opportunity to come meet, sponsored by the Georgia Petroleum Council. And so I thought, well, this is wonderful. I'll go uh, go meet my classmates and at the Ritz Carlton in Atlanta, right, right, and uh, and then go to the car races the next day, and and at every opportunity, and these lobbies were great people. They just are hired, hired guns for a cause. At every opportunity, they'd say, "No, look, the thing you do as a legislator when you're a freshman, you just don't get involved in anything, but especially don't get involved in petroleum retail divorcement." And I thought, what? Divorce? Petroleum? What is that? I, that makes no sense. I would never get involved in I can't see myself getting involved in anything like sure. that. And so I thought, well, this is interesting. That a lot of this stuff, and I've learned that a lot of stuff that the legislature faces is turf battles. Turf battles, and that's what they were worried about, a turf battle between the retail end of the petroleum industry and, and uh, you know, the, the, the refining and exploration and, and recovery and refining end of the industry. Well, what was changing about the petroleum industry, you remember we used to have all ma and pa shops. Yes. And, and they would come out and do things for you and full service type things. And then it started changing to the company owned store and, and, you know, with a convenience store attached to it. And suddenly, that just was the way the market was going. Free market, no, no, no issues there, except for the fact that Ken Abney was contractually obligated to sell Exxon product. And he pulled me off to the side. This was, a, you know, a couple of years in. He pulled me off the side and he goes, look at what they're doing to me. They own a company-owned store now. And they're selling for several cents lower than I'm having to pay them for gas. Sure. So I have to add a penny to make any money. 
And he, it, was, it just looked like they were trying to screw over the local owned shop. And so I didn't realize that what I was about to do was called Petroleum Retail Divorcement. <laughs> and, I, and I introduced the bill in 1991. Now you would have thought that I just got on top of the hill with the dinner bell and started ringing it because every lobbyist in the state of Georgia and many from outside of Georgia got hired to come and fight my bill. Now there was a side that was for my bill. It was a group called the Jobbers. Didn't do it for them, did it for Ken Abney. Right. And yet the Jobbers liked my bill. And those were the ones that, the wholesalers. They were the ones that supplied the Ma and Pa stores. And so I decided, okay, I can only carry this if I want to be honest with myself and true to my constituency. I'm only going to carry this to the extent that it helps Ken Abney. I'm not going to carry your water or oil, uh, jobbers. Uh, you'll have to get other legislators to help you with that, but I, I'm just looking out for my constituent. Well, the bill never made it out of the House. 180 member House, and it just got crushed. But later, uh, Rick Cobb, who is a wonderful, wonderful guy, I'm not even sure if he's still with us anymore, um, he bragged to the Georgia uh, Business Chronicle that they spent $800,000. Now this was $1991. That would be probably 1.5 million now or more. Lobbying 180 people. Sure, now, it, but now there's been lobby reform since that time, correct? Because, because that was- That was me. Exactly. My, because. my reaction to that the next year was to file an ethics bill. It was the Georgia Ethics in Government Act of 1992. What I wasn't expecting was the re I thought, this sounds great. And, and I loved Speaker Murphy. People have the wrong impression that he and I fought like, we, we fought. And, but I actually really admired him. He was really like a father figure to me. He kind of always kept himself in control. Uh, he was, uh, but what I didn't realize was that he utilized the lobbyist to help keep his flock in line. Uh -huh. And for example, one of the other things, one of the other kind of shocking things that, that, uh, that I saw, um, I got invited that first year to the Masters Golf Tournament. Yeah. I mean, that's a ticket that you, uh, you sure. just normally don't get. Every year I apply and every year exactly. I get turned down. Right? Well, I went two years in a row. Oh my gosh. And so then this elderly legislator from Valdosta, um, James Beck, he came to me and he said, I've done some research and your county and my county are very similar on this problem. Well, he showed me something that I knew was an issue. I just had no idea the legislature could do something about it. Catoosa County used to be served by, I think, four different telephone companies. Ringgold Telephone, you know, a very proud home, home team. And they do a lot for the community. Yeah, they do an incredible job for the community. But their reach was only so far. South Central Bell out of Chattanooga dipped into here, the Graysville area, and um, and then the Chickamauga Telephone Company had parts of the county, and then there may have been one, oh Dalton Dalton uh, Telephone Company had part of the county, wow. so four different parts of the county. I had a a, a girl that I was kind of crazy about in school. She lived down near the Peavine community. And it was long distance for her to call her neighbor across the street. Across the road, it was long distance. And I had no idea the legislature could do something about this. So I said, sign me up. I will be your second author of this bill and I'll help you champion it. 
Well, we battled and we battled and we established toll-free countywide calling. No matter what your configuration in the state, we established that to call within your county was going to be toll-free. And it passed. And it's the, amazing. And the, and the AT&T lobbyists came by and said, we're going to miss you at the Masters this year. <laughs> so there <laughs> is a string yes. attached. That, that showed me. That wasn't just looking, being uh, social or just, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're inviting you because we like you and you're a fun guy. Thanks for serving the state of Georgia yeah, and we're going to have you go. It, it was, if you don't play our ball game, we take away the ball. And that, that, I found that very insulting. And it also made me realize, what am I doing? So I, I decided I was not going to take another thing. And I was going to put this bill up. And so I got my own brave season tickets. I got my own Georgia Bulldog season tickets. And, and I was kind of defiantly saying, look, I can still do these things without you guys. You're not hurting me, but I want to I want to put this bill in. Well, you you see how things are are, are going when you're you're very early into the bill, and it's a very popular bill outside the Gold Dome. Sure, oh yeah, extremely popular inside the Gold Dome. Uh, Rhonda Cook from the Atlanta paper called me and said, "Well, I talked to somebody from the speaker's office, and this is an awkward conversation." And I said, "Well, what?" She said, uh, did a lobbyist uh, send you off on your honeymoon? I had gotten married while I was down there. And I thought, let me get back to you on that. So I contacted my new wife and I said, who gave us that flight to our honeymoon? You know, And she started reading off a list of names. Very Quite impressive, actually. Congressman Buddy Darden, who I used to work with. Uh, Larry Walker, our, our majority leader, um, all these leadership. And then at the bottom, Jake Cullens and one other lobbyist. Well, I started thinking, did my impressive list of colleagues and friends, did they actually give anything? Or did they just ride on that? Had their name attached, but somebody else yeah, put the bill. Yeah, on this long list of 12, 12 names. Sure. And so I, all I could do is say, you know what? It's pretty bad when they can sneak into your honeymoon and you don't even realize it. And so I just rolled with it and said, this is, the, this is an even bigger example of why we should do something about this. And the fact that it gets used against me in retaliation is also... Sure. Now all of a sudden you're going against them and they're going to pull that out yeah. and use it against you. And that it just shows how dirty it that's is. That's blackmail material. Yes. And so, you know, don't don't get yourself compromised. That's I, They call it, uh, like, what are they, in, uh, in Spycraft, Compromat or something. Yeah. And, uh, and so, fought forward, it, that would make a book itself on how this bill battled. We get to... Uh, the end of the session of uh, the newspapers are brutal to everybody that is standing in the way of my bill. They are listing their phone numbers oh, wow. on the editorial page and people are getting overwhelmed with calls. What I think is interesting is the spouses of, of uh, colleagues, they were telling me, you know, uh, we really like this bill, but you know, he, he's not going to be able to, he's hoping to be appointed chairman next year of, 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 you know, and so they would make the excuse, but I got it. They were, they were playing the game. And then I was kind of out there in the, on the point of the spear that was, and it was rough weather. But at the very end, when a house and a Senate, uh, and they stripped a lot of the provisions from my first bill, but I counted on the Senate to restore it. Well, when you got two different bills that pass both bodies, it's got to go to a conference committee. Historically, the author of the bill is one of the conferees from their side. I wrote uh, Speaker Murphy 
because I, I just thought, how, how do I play this? Because if I'm in the room, they're going to say, in order for this to pass, we need to strip this stuff away. Don't you want your bill to pass? And so I've very publicly sent a note, a letter to Speaker Murphy saying, I do not want to be on this conference committee. I wanted to be on the outside criticizing it. Sure. And it was a good move as it turned out because it was all getting put together. And, and then I get a visit from Senator Nathan Deal and Senator Pete Robinson, who pull me over the side and say, well, we think we can get it through, but Nathan wants to run for Congress. And are you gonna use this bill to run for Congress? Well, this was 1992. I had never thought of running for Congress. And I said, no, just please get the bill out. And they did. And so the bill comes out. It's now down to a lobbyist registration and reporting bill, which was wonderful. Sure. Because, you know, limits could be... I think it would be it would be frustrated by efforts and then ultimately just jumped and people wouldn't be paying attention to it at all. But if you just had to report, then that the citizens are going to be able to see, well, what what all has my legislator got? We see that locally, right? I mean, time and again, go to the Catoosa County uh, Commission meeting and they get up there and it'll come up to point a topic. You know, you ran and these people contributed. But, you know, it, it's an open but, thing. But it's, it's open. It's and, open and, it's, and it and should be. It shouldn't and be it's fair. hidden. Exactly. And, and, it, like and the, the people who, the way our system works, the people who are interested will point it out. And so... Uh, Keeps everybody so, honest. So it was really, I, I was still a young man. I was 32. And it was a career piece of legislation. And I... At the same time, uh, we were very frustrated in how, why this was so hard to do. This should not, this should not have been so hard to do. So it resulted in a speaker's race challenge to Speaker Murphy, who again, I greatly admired. I always prefaced all of my criticism of him by saying he deserves the biggest statue out here on the lawn, but right. you know, we need to do this, that, and that. And I think maintaining that was, I was able to keep it from getting dirty and, and I, I'm very good friends with his son, Judge Mike Murphy, and who, who we laugh about. The speaker would have turned 100 uh, last week and, oh, wow. and I reached out to him and, and uh, he, uh, so in any, in any event, uh, I, after losing a speaker's race, in the, historically, you put your tail between your legs and you just kind of faded away. I helped found, at that time, the Democrats were in charge of everything, every statewide office and every, uh, both houses of the legislature. So I helped form a group called the Democratic Reform Caucus. And we started basically continuing other reforms that the speaker didn't want. But we had failed in the speaker's race, and so this was where we went. We didn't tuck our tail between our legs. We kept doing reforms. And the, I'll give credit to Tom Murphy. He was smart. He would quietly do those reforms, not directly in reaction to our demand for it, but it would come along a few months later or the next term where he you know, would establish some new rules or suddenly we started getting to see the bill 24 hours before we had to vote on it, which was horrible when you're sitting there and the clerk comes through and, oh, here's a new bill that's coming up. And you have no idea what it does. And there's no way you can read through that much. So, so we established that, you know, we have 24 hours before we get, have to vote on something. So I was very pleased with my work in the legislature. And yet I had done, by 1996, about everything I thought I could do uh, there. 
uh, because you know I still had detractors and 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 people who who were sore, and uh, so I ran for Congress. And it was also a situation where juggling a part-time legislature and and a law practice was was difficult. So you know, if I ran for Congress, I would at least be doing something on the full time, you know, just one thing only. And uh, Richard, I got the crap beat out of it. <laughs> and it wasn't even close. And so, and, and you know what? The you races what, so, you were in there, though, when you were down at the Georgia legislature, were you ever in a close race in any of those races? No, I, I, I it's a funny story, and you got to be careful in Catoosa County. This is why I want to always speak well of, of uh, everyone. Uh, I beat Bob Peters in 1988 and I got 70% of the vote. Um, I guess he didn't take it well. I, I tried to give him an, uh, an outgoing uh, honorary reception but he, he he was hurt by the defeat and i hated it because uh you know he had been our representative for 20 years his daughter was one of my best friends in school so i tried to run against him with that heads up not going to be negative we're just going to run the race it's just time for a change and uh, i always again my micromanaging ways I hustled and at the time I went to every development in the county and hit every door and then there were a lot of long lonely roads that I hit every door uh, uh, it was just a I couldn't stop I, I was always running from behind well it was a bit of an overkill because I, I won huge I won in huge numbers and um, I was told you know, big numbers like that, you're gonna get their attention in Atlanta. They're gonna know you're you're here for a while, and that's gonna and it, and it. But I thought, well, wait a minute, I've still got a general election. Sure. And uh, the county surveyor, the the fledgling Republican Party, was putting together a, a slate with everybody. You know, it was coming along, and I knew enough about them that they were gonna come on strong in North Georgia. And so I took them very seriously. But at the same time, uh, I did some research, uh, op research you'd call it, did it on my own, down in the basement of the courthouse, just flipping through, flipping through, and found that my, re my Republican opponent was a convicted felon. Oh, wow. For attempted murder. Now, anybody can be charged in a fight with attempted murder. But he was convicted of it. And so I thought, I'm not even sure if it's him. Uh, I, I was reading the indictment. It said at Boyd Speedway, he stabbed a guy with a Dirk, a D-I-R-K. That's an old uh, Scottish, Scot Scottish, Irish term for a short blade knife. And um, I was, uh, I just struggled. What do I, what do I do with this exactly? Uh, you know? Yeah, but I just... kept listening to that voice saying, if, if you won by 70% of the vote, you're going to be something down here. And so I thought, okay, Max Cleveland was our Secretary of State, and he was coming to Chattanooga to talk about something. And I went and introduced myself to him. And I said, I got this issue. You're the, you're the superintendent of elections. I kind of want to quietly investigate to see if, y'all think this is the same person because I'm not even sure. And so next day, Max Cleveland does a news announcement that he's investigating my opponent and it, totally against the way I wanted them to do it. I felt terrible. And, and you know, a lot of people said, look, you were going to win. You know, you're, you're the guy that's just out hustling everybody. Why did you do that? And I, and I have regrets now that I did that that way uh, because it just was, it was overkill. Well, the, my opponent calls a press conference. I thought, man, I have really screwed up. This is probably his 
poor dead daddy or not him at all. Right. And uh, I've just screwed up. And uh, he has all the TV crews around and uh, they, they, for some reason they were inside the courthouse. Maybe it was raining outside or something, but there was a, 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 a platform with microphones of all the T3 local TV stations. And my opponent said, uh, first I wish you people would quit using that word Dirk. I cut that boy with a regular pocket knife. Good. And God. so by immediately my opponent was eliminated. Yeah. At the same time, it taught me a lesson because he still got a lot of votes. He was grayed out on the va- on the ballot. It was still a written ballot in those days. And there was they didn't remove him or black him out, it was grayed out. And he still got votes. And I that taught me a lesson that uh, you can overkill. Now I later overkilled in another race but but at the same time and and again disqualified a future opponent but at that point uh, uh, and that was a couple of years later when Bob Peters my former opponent brought a new opponent for me to the Capitol and proceeded the district numbers had changed since the census and reapportionment Bob bless his heart, signed the guy up for the wrong district. Oh. Because he was his old district was two. And so he signed him up. Well, it's a week-long qualifying. And uh, there was a new rule because we had voted to make some state employees undergo drug tests. And somebody says, well, how did they have to undergo drug tests if we don't? So the compromise was our qualification has to be within 72 hours of a drug test. Well, that's not random like we imposed on the state employees. Sure. We knew when we were getting our drug test, and so it was stupid. It was just ridiculous. So, uh, and qualifying like it is now, it's a week, uh, or almost a week, Friday at noon, right? Monday at 9 to Friday at noon. I'm familiar. At the state capitol. And uh, so here comes Bob with, uh, you know, a, a former office holder who signs him up for the wrong district. And Mike Snow, who was from the new district too, called me up and he said, why do I have opposition from your county? And I said, I'm sure they're going to correct it because there's time. Well, they did. They corrected it, got him signed up for the right district. But I was looking at it and they had put the wrong precinct. And now this is not fatal. But they had put the wrong precinct the, the where he lived. Not fatal at all. But I started the rumor that it was. And all I had to do was walk over to the Caducey County Courthouse and tell one person. And it spread like wildfire that I'm going to disqualify the candidate. Well, the candidate ran back to Atlanta on Friday and qualified a third time. Wow. This time outside of the 72 hour drug test. Oh. So he disqualified himself by the third qualification. Again, I was punished by people saying, why, why do you do that? Why are you such a micromanager? Why are you so obsessed with this to where you are pulling these legal technicalities on people? who just want to run for office. And again, I regret that. In hindsight, being more mature and knowing a little more about myself, I, I regret that. Um, but, and this is why you have to be careful. Years later, my second marriage, I married the niece of Bob Peter's son. <laughs> So suddenly I'm at the parties and I'm at the Christmas and and uh, Fourth of July, and I love that because Bob Peters uh, developed cancer, and he and I had some of the biggest laughs together toward the end. We had some of the best times talking about the shared experience of the Capitol and laughing about you know the the, the our race together and his attempt at knocking me out. And it, and it made me realize we're all Catoosa Countyans. And I hope we can get over some of these really 
uh, you know, I, I know your party right now is just kind of turned against itself, but we're all Catoosa Countyans, and I'm hoping that uh, we can get through this. Well, to make matters even more complicated, I, I'm, I, I, I'm go through a divorce with uh, with uh, that second wife, and uh, a couple of years ago, my old, my my eldest sister married Bob Peter's son, <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> So I go back at the 4th of July party and I said, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. Man. Well, Bob's daughter, Angela, who was my good friend in high school, and we, we've managed to remain friends through all of this. We just thought it was the funniest thing. I'm like a bad penny. I keep turning <laughs> up. And, and so, it, but again, it's another example that you just, having feuds that, last beyond the immediate issue it's it makes no sense no and, and you're right so years always give us perspective right yeah and, and like you said i wish i'd have done things differently and i think definitely in politics especially you know it's like i don't know it's almost like they think the bar has to be set to run a campaign where there's negativity and i'm just like i'm like yourself we don't need that in there you know, yeah. what we, we just need to deal with the issues or deal with the people, but not all the negativity. Yeah. Let everybody decide because every time that happens, everybody comes back years later and has regrets. Yeah. And so let's just not even have to worry about those regrets. So you run. So I'm, this book begins, other than the prologue, uh, which is uh, my publisher said, you got to have a prologue because, uh, you know, beginning with the day you're destroyed in a congressional race that, that we don't think that's the best start. So I wrote a prologue that tells, that goes back, um, or I guess goes forward a few months to uh, Alvin going for help. And Alvin's a very, uh, by neurotypical, observation there's some oddities there and of course didn't know why but this came up in the trial why did you drive right by a, a fire station with an ambulance there very obvious uh, why did you go that way and then start to leave town and then he turned around in the old uh, Battle of Ringgold Gap Memorial and went to the ShopRite, which is now the grocer's outlet, I think it's called, and tried a payphone that was up against the wall of the outside of the ShopRite. It didn't work. So he goes to, there used to be a phone stand on Lafayette Street near the exit of the post office, which was the road my office was on, and just across the street from the 911 office and make first a call to Erlanger Hospital in Chattanooga. Well, we now know that Alvin didn't trust a soul in this county. Yeah. And he didn't trust a soul in government, for sure. But it's the hook, hopefully, that, that pulls the reader in of why is this guy acting so unusual. And, and um, you know, if 911 did it, I, I didn't say they did, but I said they could have looked out the one window on that side and seen him so, while they're talking to him. Uh, you know, Alvin's voice had a very flat effect, emotionless, that was used against him in the trial. Um, his emotions did not meet the moment that we thought the, the casual observer, the neurotypical now we know observer, would think, well, wouldn't you be more upset right. if you just found your wife dead? And so those kind of things immediately made him suspect. And then just his very, uh, Alvin will not answer a direct question uh, very easily. And that began to play itself out. I experienced it as well. So I kind of got 
why everybody was frustrated. Everybody, it, with what we knew at the time, Alvin earned the suspicion. And so the following Monday, this was January, uh, this was October 4, 1997, when Virginia passed. But I remember the first waves of information that I was hearing, uh, the speculation that there was a, like a, a dead woman found out on the grounds or half buried or something like that. And then, you know, the second wave of information, like, oh, it's his wife. And everybody's saying, what wife? Right. Some of the older people in town remembered that he got married, but Alvin himself was throwing people off when they would ask about her. Oh, she's left a long time ago. Oh, I had to put her in a hospital. Or, or just, just different things that he would say because he was highly suspicious that that was Virginia's family trying to flush her out. Sure. <clears throat> and so it kind of culminated well, her parents started putting newspaper articles in the paper. And I, I, thanks to the Catoosa County News, I, I was able to list, uh, show one of them, uh, Parents Seek Married Daughter. And, and that was 1968. And um, there was also uh, one in the Chattanooga Times or Free Press, I can't remember, maybe both. Um, parents very worried and wanting to see their daughter that they hadn't seen in 15 months. Well, they, they supported the marriage, the parents did. Interestingly, Alvin's parents didn't. But they, the, Virginia's parents supported the marriage, but Virginia was, was special and, and warranted their concern. She had had severe epilepsy since she was a child. She had also had a history of occasionally having a bad reaction to the meds for epilepsy. Wow. And so they were rightfully concerned. But Alvin would say she didn't want to see them. And so uh, I was uh, trying to figure out now how, why would somebody not want to see their own family? Uh, how can a grudge last that long? And what was the grudge about, Alvin? Well, her parents raided our apartment looking for beer. No, oh, my gosh. They were very religious people. Sure. But again, this was a dry county. That was a, that was a fair suspicion back then. Right. Here's this guy that came out of the army, married our sweet daughter, and now you know, what have they got over in that house? Maybe some beer, you know? So they, they raid the place. It so offended Virginia. Another thing offended Virginia very greatly was uh, the housing authority manager let the exterminator in uh, without giving any notice. Virginia was in the bath. Oh. Yeah. The guy, you know, frightens her in the bath and then asks her out. Apparently, asking the way to ask people out if, back then was, "Do you want to go riding around?" <laughs> that was that was the uh, that was how you ask a girl out in those days. You want to go riding around, and uh, she was greatly offended. Interestingly, you know, we all know people in Catoosa County that men who would be so offended that there would be violence, there would be you know a confrontation. But no, Alvin was not like that. They just decided that they would leave when they thought the exterminator was going to run in the future. So there were a lot of misreads and Virginia would go stay with other people in the community. Uh, I'm just now learning after the trial that they she would spend a day with so-and-so and spend a day with so-and-so. And so a lot of people in the community were exposed to Virginia but they were older and a lot of them were gone by the time this was happening because we're talking about the 1960s. Alvin and Virginia got their marriage license three weeks after Dolly Parton and Carl Dean got theirs. And then 
That was 1966. And then they were married up at uh, Pleasant Valley Baptist in Rabbit Valley, just down the road here. Uh, by D.H. Orr, who was a part-time butcher and part-time preacher. <laughs> and uh, practice his butchering there in downtown Ringo. And then uh, by 1969, when George Jones and Tammy Wynette got renewed their vows in Ringgold because they were married overseas, I think, and they, they felt like they needed to domesticate them. So they just came to Ringgold too. So Ringgold was the, the place that Nashville knew about and the Nashville elite knew about. You can go down to this little town a couple of hours, in and out, one-stop shopping, get your marriage done. Um, by the time George and Tammy came to Ringgold, Virginia was already missing. She was no longer uh, with her family. Obviously, her family conspired with the housing authority to file an eviction against them in 1970. The, the position of the housing authority was, you're violating the contract if you're not staying here. And so Alvin being Alvin, it becomes a circus of a trial. Sure. Thank, thank everything that Alvin made me study all this old litigation because it gave me such insight and prepared me for the trial. I thought it was a distraction. I thought I can't get him to talk about the murder case. All he wants to talk about is the man and all the ills that have befallen them in civil litigation. But by forcing me to look at it and read it, I was prepared better for the trial. And I realized that why would her parents show up at an eviction trial? Well, Judge Painter, who was our chief judge back then, he was the judge over the trial, and it, became, it apparently became such a circus that he just stopped the trial and told Alvin, I want your wife brought in here. So they used the system to yeah. flush her out. So Alvin's father went to get Virginia, brought her into the courtroom, went back into chambers with the judge, her parents, and Alvin's father. Alvin was not allowed to go. And when she came out, the judge ruled... Uh, for the eviction, but basically taking it away from the jury. And, but Virginia's parents went home and never really put another article in the paper again. So by report from Virginia to Alvin and Alvin's dad to Alvin, Virginia said, when I got married, my husband and I became one. Why? I don't want to see you. I don't want to go to your house. I don't want to go to your church. I'm, I'm with my husband and you took us out of our home. And she never let go of that resentment. And I only know that because of the discoveries later in the house. But uh, interestingly, in that file at the time, there was a jury list. And I got, I scrolled through it. And back then, you look at a jury list, you knew half of them. Sure. And I knew, well, I knew some had passed because this was 27 years later that I'm looking at it, 28 years later. And I see Mary Hakes. I know Mary Hakes represented her son, I believe. I'm going to call up Mary Hakes. And she remembered it. She said it was the most bizarre thing. We, we didn't know exactly why we were there. Uh, this guy's putting on quite a defense and then the judge stops the thing and this little petite lady comes in and and uh, so it, it validated all of that to me and so of course then Alvin would not from day one Alvin seemed to be intent on kneecapping any defense that I was trying to put together and I could not figure out why. And so ultimately uh, he was charged and that's when I said, okay, we're, because I was talking to him three, well, five days after her death. I was seeing him two days after her death and I never, I never saw Alvin Ridley, but he seemed to be on the same intersection with me every day. 
and he was launching from the same payphone stand that he made the 911 call from. And he obviously didn't have a phone at home, and uh, but they had a phone at home in the past. And so I began my advice to him, uh, later learned that he had too many assets to be for me to be appointed a law, him a lawyer. So ultimately he gave me a security interest in the dilapidated Zenith shop, and we used that to get him out on bond when they arrested him eight months later. Uh, and that's when I said, okay, the game is on now, my friend. Well, you know, I actually convinced myself that maybe they're not going to charge him. She had epilepsy. You know, maybe they're not going to charge him. Um, so ultimately, we, uh, I, I, I run into a wall trying to get access to his house because I want to combat this notion that she was being held against her will there. And, 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 and listen, I, I, if I have five sisters. If one of them disappeared, I would have done everything the Hickeys did and more. Sure. Because I, I, I think I would have been in the position to do more. I would have figured out, okay, I need to get, I need to hire a PI and follow them around, you know, to find my sister. So I never thought that the Hickey family overdid it. Uh, Virginia's father died. She did not go to the funeral. Uh, Virginia's mother uh, went to a nursing facility. This left sisters and a brother who, you know, they were frustrated. This person had left their life. And so they were very strong on putting out the rumors that we were having to battle. The rumors that caused the uh, National Examiner tabloid to put out the title, Sicko Holds Wife Captive for 30 Years, Then Kills Her. So those were, uh, those were very frustrating, but more frustrating was the fact that Alvin would not let me come over to his house. Yeah. So I finally figured out that he was calling me and screaming at me in the middle of the night from pay phones, different places, but I could hear traffic in the background. I could hear, he was just having a meltdown. And so I figured out a way to, you know, Alvin was paranoid. If he thought if I had a big plan to meet with him, who knows who will be there or who knows what kind of electronic surveillance will be watching him. So I figured that out about him and I said, Alvin, just, just come to my office. I'll, whenever you want to come by, if I'm with somebody, I'll take a break and talk with you. But this way you control, you control everything. And once I gave him that element of control, things calmed down considerably. Next thing I said was, look, I'm going to put the phone back in your house. I had ulterior motives. I wanted to get in his house. Yeah. So uh, Kevin with the phone company was the guy that was going to be the installer. And by pre-planning, uh, Kevin Hill, by pre-planning, I was going to be there when he was there. And we were going to see that house. Well, Alvin outsmarted as Alvin likes to say he outsmarted me by having the phone installed on the porch <laughs> and so it was just constant uh, constant run-ins and and figuring out a way to work together and ultimately uh, Alvin you know he would take legal advice from this guy named salesman Sam and that's in here too yeah so. Where can we get the book? If, if people here locally, or where can we get the book? That way they could go through here and just read this amazing book. Well, locally, they can get it uh, real locally at a fern and a feather. And it's a gift shop in Ringo. Right in downtown. Ringo. I always stumble on the name. I want to call it a farm and a fork, or a fern and a yeah, fork, yeah. or a farm and a feather. What? Fer a fern and a feather. That's correct. And um, it's right there. Um, next to the ice cream shop, immediately next to the ice cream shop, which all these places over the years have been different things. The ice cream shop used to be Price Ringgold Drug. Um, so that's wonderful. Part of the wonderful thing about this book is it takes people back in time so they'll know what used to be sure. here and what used to be there. And um, 
So it's uh, and now they can also go over to the mall here in town. Barnes and Noble has Barnes and Nobles has it in stock. Every yeah. online bookseller has the book there that we go. you can order it online from. I've been very pleased, Richard, in the reception to the book because it's it, it is a very personal book to me because I you know I I went through a transformation. Alvin pushed me into that transformation. And I didn't want to lose again. I had lost a congressional race, gone through a divorce, had a presidential appointment dangled out there for me that I grabbed at without even thinking about it, that immediately evaporated. And so I could very easily see this thing being a fourth big loss. And yet at the same time, there's something very compelling about Alvin. Uh, I was noticing uh, things about him that made me realize, you know, this guy needs me. He doesn't want to admit it. He, he wants to prove every day that he's smarter than me. And sometimes he was. Uh, so it was, he was a very intriguing character. Uh, my father, uh, was going through a transformation of his own during this time. Uh, my sisters and I, we had finally did an intervention on our father uh, after I was starting to advise Alvin. And uh, at East Ridge Hospital, now it's called something else, Park Ridge, I think, um, I disclosed to my dad that I was talking to Alvin. I generally didn't do that even to wives, I would just say. I wouldn't violate attorney-client confidentiality, so I wouldn't even tell if I was seeing somebody about, the, about a case. And this was in the early stages. It took them eight months to charge Alvin. And so during these early stages, I'm talking to my dad, and, and he's sober. And I said, listen, I've been talking to Alvin Ridley. And my dad gave me some insight about Alvin. He said, you know, he's unusual. He's, he thinks differently, uh, but he's a good man. And in a weird way, I was, you know, stuck with Alvin so as not to disappoint my dad. And it all comes around during the trial when Alvin said, your daddy's here. And my first reaction was fear because I thought, is he drunk? You know, wow. if, do I now have this distraction and worry about this? And he was not. And it was about the first thing in my life that I, he was coming to that I was participating in. And I'm talking about years of ball games and track meets and sure. different things that uh, he didn't come to or I didn't want him to come to. And didn't tell him about because I would gauge what's his what's his status this, right. this week. Or, um, so it was very emotional that my dad is at the trial. Now I'm putting together this book, and the the we used to have the Chattanooga Times, the Chattanooga Free Free Press, and I went to all of them saying, "What have you got on the Alvin Ridley trial?" Well. The Times, sadly, just threw away their negative archive, their morgue. They call it the morgue. And that was a place I used to love to go and just look and research sure. old things because you can find a whole lot from pictures they didn't use. You can find a whole lot of history there. Well, the Free Press archives were in the uh, UTC library. And I was able to get a couple of campaign shots from my, la my campaigns to use it then. And then, uh, but I, then I remembered the newspapers merged a week before this trial. So where are the Times Free Press archives in photo more? In the Hamilton County, uh, Chattanooga Hamilton County Library, 244 trial photos. Oh, wow. And all I'm, I'm telling you, it, it, it was a game changer. 
um, because then I can give the reader visuals. But what really kind of overwhelmed me was there's three pictures of my dad oh. who passed away in 2009. And it's at the end of the trial when everybody is kind of a celebratory mood and he's whispering something to Alvin. And I ask Alvin, do you remember what my dad was whispering to you? And he, you know, Alvin doesn't, but, uh, and he wouldn't even, uh, when, when, when a neurodiverse person is not going to make something up to make you feel better. <laughs> right. They're just going to say, no. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I'm learning Alvin, but I didn't know anything about the neurodiversity until three years ago. And Kim Clark Barnes tells the podcaster uh, in, in Chattanooga asked Mr. Poston, does he think Alvin may be autistic? And it just was like a cold bucket of water on me that made me realize he probably is. And so with Alvin's permission, I took him to Atlanta. Um, he wanted me to sit in on some of the evaluation and then the doctor said she wanted to do some of it without me in the room and which was fine with me but uh, one of the things she tested on him was asking a series of questions what do these statements make you feel like she's gotten under your skin well I would just shuddered it's like why would anybody do that why would anybody get under my skin you know, that's an expression that we often use we do, when somebody's bothering us, but he took it very literally. literally. Wow. And then the next one was, he wears his heart on his sleeve. And Alvin was very proud of himself. He said, I know, he's got an artificial heart. <laughs> well, I've been showing Alvin my insulin pump for years, and I would say, this replaced my pancreas, and I yeah. stick it in my pocket. So I could see where he got that. But it was very literal. If somebody's wearing their heart on their sleeve, Alvin knows it's an artificial heart. Wow. And so it suddenly dawned on me, I felt guilty about some of the moments of frustration. Uh, Alvin doesn't like the sensation of water on him. So not a lot of bathing happens. Sure. And that was often <laughs> my chief complaint about Alvin. But even before... I learned about why I got over that because at the end of that trial, I didn't care. This was a guy that I knew was innocent and his smell didn't bother me anymore. And, and I think that's something that I had to get over. And again, I hope people get from this book that that person in your community that you don't exactly like the way they're dressed or the like the way that they uh, they smell or anything like that, maybe they can't help it. And I, as I learned very pointedly, within right after the one time I mentioned I wish he would take a bath, I get skunked in my own office. <laughs> And now I'm smelling, but the files got really soaked because they were right by the register that it came in. And so for days, people commented on skunk smell whenever I would walk through with those files. And uh, it, it reinforced that we can't always help our circumstances. That's great. Well, I think we're running out of time here. They're telling me the cameras are going to run out of battery. Oh, listen. Wow. Thanks again for coming on. Folks, please do yourself a favor. Get you a copy of Zenith Man. You won't regret it. Thank you so much for Ken being here with us today. And until next time, thanks, Catoosa County. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. I well appreciate done. it. Let's just break this down to the simplest truth.